2 Kings, the fourth chapter. And uh, we're going to read verses 1 and 2. Amen. And we'll read out of the uh, Contemporary English Bible. When you have it, say amen. If you don't have it yet, look at the screen. For those of you who are, uh, uh, who are watching, uh, streaming live, we say God bless you. We thank you for being a part of our online community and, uh, and church. And um, I'm, uh, if you need uh, the lesson outline, if you'll go to the website, click on the menu button, and uh, go down to the app, download the app, the CLC app, and you'll have all of the technology right there at your fingertips. Amen. Uh, you can also go all the way down. If you pass the app button and go down to sermon notes, you can, you can click on that and it'll bring up the outline of sermon notes. And you'll have, uh, you'll have my outline and my notes right there to help guide you through uh, our lesson on today. All right. This is going to be real good. Praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, 2 Kings, the fourth chapter, 2 Kings, the fourth chapter, verses 1 and 2. Let's read together, saints of God. Ready? Read. Now there was a woman who had been married to a member of a group of prophets. She appealed to Elisha, saying, My husband, your servant, is dead. You know how he feared the Lord. But now someone he owed money to has come to take my two children away as slaves. Elisha said to her, what can I do for you? Tell me what you still have left in the house. She said, your servant has nothing at all in the house except a small jar of oil. We're in this series of lessons called uh, Why Serve, and uh, I'm going to entitle today's lesson The Entitled Servant. The Entitled Servant. Amen. And I'll, uh, I'll subtitle this lesson Entitled to Win. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Entitled to Win. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this time circled together around your word. I thank you, Father, for the online community that have assembled themselves, God, to worship uh, online and be a part of our, our worship today. I thank you for those who have assembled themselves together in this place, Father. We thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. And I pray also and thank you for God, those that will come into contact with his teaching at a later date. Now, Father, since you know what's name by name and situation by situation, I'm asking that you will think through my mind, gesture through my limbs, articulate through my vocal cords, Father, and provide us with, with revelation on the spot, a rhema word, God, that goes beyond even my preparation and study time. And tailor this lesson to meet each of us right where we are, Father, bringing forth a tremendous and amazing harvest of insight, of revelation, a harvest of service, and, and a harvest of prosperity. Father, we love you. We thank you and we honor you and we call it done in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. amen. All right. Now, let's, uh, the, uh, the objective of today's lesson uh, is to empower the servant of Christ with revelation uh, from the word of God to pursue and obtain victory over life circumstances. We're going to be talking about how to win. Everyone say how to win. Yeah, yeah. And see, many have not decided to truly trust God and completely dedicate themselves to a life that is built on a foundation of faith in Christ and the word of God. And when believers do, when believers finally do this, when we finally pursue the promises of God without reservation, the result is going to be monumental. Jesus said to Peter, Jesus said that Peter's failure to trust in what God said, Jesus said that he could do, is what caused him to sink. Because Peter lacked confidence in what God said that he could do. Amen? And as servants of Christ, we must totally commit to trusting God and pursue what he promised well, uh, 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 without fear, without question, and without timidity. Hallelujah. Without fear, without question, and without timidity. Now, I'm going to talk to you about a few things because as servants of the Most High God, we've got to dive into this thing. As we just read, the, the woman of God there who was there uh, talking to Elisha says to him, she says, you know what, my husband now, my husband has died and, uh, and you know, and he's, he, was a, he was a servant. He was your servant. And now that he's died, uh, you know, he owes some money to creditors and the creditors are coming to threatening to take away, uh, you know, uh, my children as slaves so that they can we can repay the debt 
Now, uh, he, he's, he immediately looks at her and says, well, what do you have in the house? What can I do for you? And then she says something else. She says, your servant has nothing. Now, what, the, what is so amazing to me is that the woman now comes to Elijah because she knows that he can do something about it. And this woman says, you know what? I'm coming to you because you know my husband was a servant and I have a right. Listen now. I have a right to bring this need before God. Amen. Amen. Watch her now. She has a right to bring this need before God. I have a right to bring this need. And then she begins, she says that her husband was a servant. Then as Elijah talks to her, she says, your servant has nothing, which means my husband's a servant of God and I am a servant of God. Now, this word entitled, this word entitled, we're going to explain, and I'll give you the definition of that in a few moments, but m most times in our culture is, is viewed as a negative word, but it's not really a negative thing here. She's coming because she says, you know what, I have a right to be blessed. I got a right to be rescued. Come on, somebody. I got a right to be cared for and protected. I'm, t I'm, telling, you, I'm telling you where she is, where she is now. She's not confused about her position and her connection and relationship to God. Amen. When you serve God, you gain four things. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, but I'm going to work my way through this list because when you serve God, you gain four things. Amen? Hallelujah. Number one is that you gain acceptance. Everyone say acceptance. Yeah, you gain acceptance. Acceptance, the action or the process of being received as adequate, typically to be admitted into a group. Amen. Christ did everything for you to be accepted. And so when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, God accepts us as his sons and daughters. Amen. So all I had to do now was accept, accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And by making myself a follower and a servant of Christ, now Jesus Christ brings me into this relationship with God. When you talk about acceptance, it's generally like somebody bringing you to a group. Y'all know what I mean? Like in order, like sometimes on certain things that you, that you need to get plugged into, you need to have a reference. Somebody has to refer you. Y'all know what I mean? Amen. And so Jesus brings us into this relationship and we gain acceptance. If you've never experienced acceptance into a group, regardless of, of uh, your past, regardless of what you look like, regardless of of challenges that you might be facing, man, that acceptance is like amazing. And that's what Jesus did for us. Because we know that we're not perfect. We know we're still working on some things. <laughs> Hallelujah. But Jesus brings us into this relationship with God. Hallelujah. And we gain acceptance. Look at the book of Romans. Look at the book of Romans. Man, this is good. Romans 10, verses 9, 9 and 10. And we'll read out of the uh, uh, at a living Bible. Let's read together. Ready, read. For if you tell others with your own mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in his heart that a man becomes right with God and with his mouth he tells others of his faith, confirming his salvation. He says, man, I'm telling you, you get acceptance when you confess Jesus, but you've got to believe in your heart and then confess it out loud. But when you do this, hallelujah, you, you all of a sudden get born again and you gain acceptance you, as, a, a, as a, a being a part of God's family. Number two, number two is that, that when I become a servant of God, I also gain ascension. Amen. Everyone say, I go higher. Yeah. Ascension is the act of raising or rising to an important position or a high level. Amen. So when I accept Jesus and I become a servant, I've got to become a servant. Hallelujah. I've got to become a servant. But when I do, I gain ascension. I go to a higher level. Amen. The woman now. Now, remember, this woman is able to come to the prophet of the age. She's able to come, not, not just get to the pastor, but she's able to get to the pastor's pastor's pastor. And she walks right in. Hallelujah. She has status. Look at Romans 8 and, and uh, uh, 17. Romans 8 and 17. He says, and since we are his true children, we qualify. Yeah, he says we qualify to share all his treasures. Glory to God. Somebody shout, I qualify. I qualify. 
so I qualify to share all of Christ's treasures. Amen. For indeed, we are heirs of God himself. And since we are joint heirs to Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he my status has changed. When I become a servant of God, he's saying, man, you got access to everything. And see, most of us really do not understand our true status before God. And he says, no, 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 no. You have, when you got born again, you, you were already, you raised, you moved up a notch, hallelujah. Not just one notch, hallelujah. You're seated, the Bible says, in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And this happened in an instant once you got saved and you became a servant of God. You had a status change. You received ascension. All of a sudden, God knows who you are. Hallelujah. Number three, number three, when we, when we uh, uh, make ourselves or we, when we uh, begin to serve God, hallelujah, when we gain assignment. Amen. Everyone say assignment. assignment. Yeah. Assignment, this means that God gives that God gives us purpose and he gives us work. He gives us purpose and he gives us what? Work, 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 work. He gives us work. In fact, you see God doing this. I know this is not, we're not in a family life series yet, but we'll talk about this. But he gives us work. And, and we'll notice in the beginning, pre-fall now, prior to the fall in the book of Genesis, the fall happened afterward and prior to the law. The law didn't come about, the, 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 the commandments, 613 commandments, it's not 10, but all 613 commandments didn't come about until Moses. Amen. So pre-fall, pre-Adam and Eve sinning, and pre the, 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 the commandments of God was the time where God created the man. He creates the man. God, the Bible says, forms him out of the dust of the ground, and then he takes the man and he puts him in the garden and he gives the man what? Work and purpose. He tells the man, tend to the garden. Take care of the garden. Watch over the garden. Expand the garden. Make the garden grow and fill the whole earth with it. Amen. Why is this important? This is important, ladies, especially because before you, before the man got a wife, he had a job. Somebody better get that. Hallelujah. Yeah, he had a job and he had purpose. Amen. So men, before you go start looking for somebody, you need to go get a job and understand your purpose hallelujah all right we'll come back to that in six months amen <laughs> so the man now the man now has been given he's been he, he's been he's been given we we understand we gain acceptance when we when we serve God we gain acceptance we gain ascension we gain assignment and then we gain accolades accolades we gain accolades accolades are a mark of acknowledgement in other words, God looks at us and then he begins to recognize who we are. Hallelujah. The song leader said, God knows my name. Amen. So when you gain accolades, this is where a God says to you, well done, thy good and faithful servant. See, the servant is recognized by God. The servant is seen by God. The servant receives the accolades of God. Hallelujah. He knows that the, the Bible, the Bible says that God knows who he is and he recognizes him. Glory to God. This is really important because God, it doesn't say that he says, well done, thy good and, and faithful CEO. Well done, thy good and faithful vice president. Well done, thy good and faithful pastor or apostle. He says, well done, thy good and faithful what? Servant. Servant. And then Jesus goes on to tell us later that everyone who's going to be great, everyone who's going to become a leader, especially those who are going to lead in my kingdom, should become a servant of everybody. See, God doesn't measure success and greatness in, in the kingdom of God by how many people serve you. That's how the world does it. The world says, how many employees y'all got? How many employees you got at your company? Oh, you're a big Fortune 500 company. Oh, you're a Fortune 200 company. You're awesome. No, he, the Bible says that God measures greatness in the kingdom by how many people you serve, not by how many people serve you. Oh. A servant is great in the eyes of God. 
Now, there are many amazing characteristics about a servant of God that often go unrecognized. And I'm going to share a few of these with you as we talk about uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this real, oh man, we talk about this, this revelation about uh, how awesome and how blessed a servant is. Let me give you these five revelations. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but we had to stop somewhere. So I'm going to stop at four or five. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Number one, servants think differently. Yeah, servants think differently. Glory to God. The world has its way of thinking, but servants think differently. We're, we're, we're supposed to be different. We look at the world differently. Amen. Look at Numbers 14 and 24. Let's read this together. Numbers 14 and 24, New Century Version. Let's read together. Ready? Read. But my servant, Caleb, thinks... He thinks what? Now, let's look, at, look at what God says about him. He says, but my servant, Caleb, Number one, he identifies the servant as being his. You see what y'all see what I'm talking about? I mean, it's awesome when God can step down and say, no, 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 that, 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 that her right there, that young lady right there, she's mine now. No, 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 that young man, that's mine. Now, now I'm fool with him if you want to. He belongs to me. Amen. See, God identifies with the servant, and when we make ourselves servants of God, God openly begins to confess that we belong to him. Hallelujah. Remember when Jesus received the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when he was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, and the Bible says he came out of the water, and then the heavens opened up, and the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove, and then a voice boomed from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. Hallelujah. He recognizes him as being his servant. When you humble yourself and make yourself a servant of God, God begins to uh, take ownership of you. Glory to God. He says, but, but, but my servant, Caleb, he's my servant. He thinks differently and follows me, how? Completely. My goodness gracious. He says, man, he follows me completely. He thinks differently. He thinks different than the world thinks. He doesn't think like everybody else thinks. Amen. This is real important because you're not supposed to think how everybody else thinks. That's why you do things differently. You respond to challenge differently. You approach adversity differently. Hallelujah. You're different. Yeah, you're different. Okay, all right. But my servant Caleb thinks he thinks differently. That's what sets us apart because we think differently. We've chosen to become or to be a servant of God. He said he thinks differently and follows me completely. So I will bring him into the land he has already seen. <laughs> Let me just ask you, what have you envisioned? When you read the promises of God, where do you see yourself? What have you imagined and envisioned yourself doing? Where have you imagined and envisioned yourself being? Because the promises of God are designed to spur your imagination and cause you to begin to say, you know what? Victory is possible for me. Better is possible for me. Hallelujah. Success is possible for me. Make an impact in this generation is possible for me. Where do you see yourself? Because he says, I will bring him into what he has already seen. Have you seen it in your mind and your spirit? See, you need, to, you need to change your meditation. Many of us see ourselves as failures. We see ourselves as losers. No, you need to see yourself as being victorious. See yourself healed. See yourself whole. See yourself at peace. See yourself with joy. See yourself full of happiness. Glory to God. See yourself with more. See yourself with plenty. See yourself successful. Glory to God. He says, I'll bring him into it. And then watch this. He says uh, that, that he has already seen, and his children will own that land. His children will also possess what he has envisioned. Oh, so, he's saying your children are going to be blessed because you chose to serve God. You chose to release your faith and believe. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That means the way I think governs my reality. 
if I can just change the way I think. I'm supposed to think differently. I'm supposed to think like God. The apostle said, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus was always talking about what the kingdom was like. He was always talking what heaven was like. He was always talking about what we're going to receive and what we're going to experience. What are you talking about? What have you been thinking? What do you envision? Where do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as being seated in heavenly places? Do you see yourself as being victorious, a person who has recovered if you've ex if experienced loss? Or a person who is going higher if you're already on a high level? How do you see yourself? Amen. And now as you become a servant of God, he says the children will his children will possess the land. Listen to me carefully. Listen to me very carefully. There is this kingdom revelation and insight that, that there a, of how power, authority, anointing, and favor is transferred in the kingdom. It is done by anointing. You can lay hands on someone. It is also transferred through service. Now think, think, think. As you read through the Old Testament, you'll see over and over and over again where God says to people, groups of people, and to persons, individuals, he say to them that I'm going to bless you for your father's sake. Had nothing to do with you. I'm going to bless you because of what they did. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that when you choose to serve God, that the people that are connected to you will experience blessing and favor because of your service. I would tell Carl all the time, I'd say, hey, listen, don't think just because, you know, you're so smart and you're so wise and you have your master's degree that this is why you succeed and you have a good job and you're stress-free and all that. No, that's not why. No, it's by the favor of God. And part of the favor of God that is on your life is because the service of your mamas and your daddy. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. See, when you choose to serve God, you want to be a blessing to your children. You want to be a blessing to those who are around you. Serve God and the favor of God will spill off of you and spill on to. He says he, diff he serves, he's different, and he follows me completely. Follows me completely means to have total trust. Not having a divided heart or a divided mind, or a divided uh, philosophy on life, a divided uh, way of living. He says, no, he follows me completely. Amen. Amen. Follows me completely. Hallelujah. In the book of 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verses 14 through 18, I want you to see this in the Message Bible. He says, don't become partners with those who reject God. You're connected to God. You're, you're supposed to think differently. You shouldn't even be connected to other, those kind of people who don't believe and trust God. No, no, no. I've got to see if I'm going to be successful, I've got to change my circles. That's why it's important for me to be connected and be here with the people who are the people who believe the believe like I believe. Amen. He, he explains here, he says, how can you make a partnership out of a right and wrong? That's not partnership. That's war. Hallelujah. Those two don't even flow together. Come on, somebody. So he said, why are you walking around hanging out with people that don't even believe the way you believe, that don't trust God? Watch this. Have you ever been in a place where you were really believing and trusting God and then all of a sudden you had a conversation with someone you didn't believe and you ended up leaving that conversation all down and all of a sudden you start doubting your faith? You got to stay away from them kind of people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No, you got you to stay away from them. He says, is light best friends with dark? Does Christ go strolling with the devil? Don't trust. He says, do, do trust and mistrust hold hands? Who would think of setting up pagan idols in God's holy temple? He says, but that is exactly what we are. Each of us, a temple in whom God lives. God lives in us. He says, so why would we associate with people of doubt? People who don't, who, re who rejected God in his ways. And we hang out with people like that. 
we have conversations with people like that, and they start asking you crazy stuff like, girl, why you, I mean, why are you tithing? You giving your money to that church? I don't give my money to church. I give my money to God and in support of what God is doing in the earth. Hallelujah. I'm serving God. This is one of the ways that I do that in full support of what God is doing in the earth. God called me to do this. But when you sit around with people like that and they say, oh, well, I wouldn't do that. I know that's, that's, why, that's, that's, why, that's why you are where you <laughs> You're not going to hear God say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. What you're going to hear is God say, I never knew you. Who are you? I never knew you. He says, but this is exactly what we are. Each of us a temple in whom God lives. So live, so leave the corruption. Separate yourself from those kind of circles. It's amazing when you, have you, watch this. Have you noticed that sometimes you come to church and you didn't feel like coming? Amen. Hallelujah. Way too many amens on that. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, 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 seriously. I, no, I get it. I get it. But, but, but once you get here in this atmosphere, something begins to happen. Y'all know what I'm talking about? The person down your road starts to worship and you hear somebody else down on the other side or somebody in front of behind you saying, thank you, God. I trust you, Lord. I believe God. You are a good God. And you start wondering, well, why was I so down? The God I serve is a good God. And it begins to remind you and put you in the right frame of mind. And you start looking at things. And the next thing you know about that same situation that you carried in here, burdened down, you start thinking differently. That's why we've got to make sure we're surrounded around the right people. God knows this. That's why he says to us, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Because when you get to worship, amazing things happen. I can't afford to stay at home. I got to get up and get to church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. I needed you on my road. What you talking about? I needed to hear you. I needed to see you worship. I needed to see your hands go up. I needed to hear you say God is good. I needed to hear you say hallelujah. I needed to watch you dance. I needed to watch you turn around. Hallelujah. So he says, leave this kind of corruption where you're in an environment. People start talking down and unbelief. Baby, I got to go. They'd be like, girl, hold on, what's up? You said, no, 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 I got to go. I, I said, There's, you're sowing seed, and I can't receive that into my heart. I'm believing God for something right now. I got to stand strong. Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, what am I going to do? Just hold on. I'm, you know, I got the CLC app. I'm getting ready to send you a video of Pastor Carl preaching on this. Yeah. Amen. He says, so leave corruption and compromise. Leave it for good, says God. Don't link up with those who will pollute you. I want you all for myself. Then he says, I'll be a father to you. You'll be sons and daughters to me. The word of the master God. Don't do what they do. Serve me. That's really what he's saying. Don't do what they do. Serve me. Hallelujah. Number two, servants expect and experience inconveniences. Are you serious, Pastor? I am very serious. Yes, there will be inconveniences. You cannot serve God without being inconvenienced. Amen. You, what, what are you saying, Pastor? You're going to be inconvenienced? I remember the story where Jesus is getting ready to make the triumphal entry into the temple and he goes and he tells his disciples, he said, hey, listen, go down, this, go down the path, go down the street, go to this village. When you get in there, the first house on the left, you will see that they have a mule. Tell them a donkey. Tell them and get the donkey and bring it back to me because that's what he was going to ride in on. He says, tell them that I have need of it. Tell them the Lord has need of it and then they will let you have it. Amen. Can you imagine you just got one car? And then the Lord shows up and says, hey, listen, I need your car. Do you think the family was slightly inconvenienced? 
The servant of God makes themselves of no reputation, and if I'm going to be a servant of God, then that means that I am going to experience inconvenience. So what are they going to say? Hey, we'll tell the Lord that I was just getting ready to go to the grocery store. Just give me a couple hours and he can borrow it then. No. He says, bring it here. I have use of it right now. I remember Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was sitting there. The Bible says Jesus was coming down the street. He had heard that he was coming. Zacchaeus was a, was a, was a tax collector. Considered He was a chief tax collector, meaning that he was a chief sinner. Amen. He, he, and uh, he, he, he heard Jesus was coming. The Bible says he was a man that was small of stature. And so when Jesus was coming and the crowd was coming, the Bible says he climbed up into a tree. He, so he climbed up into a tree so he could see it. And as Jesus was walking by, Jesus looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down, for the Lord have need of thee. I have need of you. The Bible says uh, Jesus came down, Z Zacchaeus came down, and then Jesus went to his house. He said, hey, listen, I need somewhere to chill in this city. I need somewhere to hang out, blah, 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 blah. And he does that. Now watch, this is what is so amazing. Do you think Jesus rode by himself? No. Jesus didn't roll by himself. The Bible says he had hundreds of disciples. We always think of the 12. No, he had more than 12. So when, so when Jesus says, I have need of you, what Jesus is really saying, I'm coming to your house and I'm bringing my entourage with me. Let's put this in perspective, what Jesus was actually asking. Back in those days, to be hospitable to guests, one of the things that you do as soon as they get to the crib is you put, put out water and, 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 and hands and you wash everybody's feet. Oh, y'all didn't say that. You wash everybody's feet before they walk in the house. So Jesus, <laughs> so Jesus what, you're really ask, what you're really asking is for me to wash everybody's feet. And then all these people got to do what when they're there? They got to get something to eat and something to drink. They're going to drink all the chicken is gone. <laughs> He's asking him to serve. It is an inconvenience to show up. It's an inconvenience when two or three people show up at your house unannounced. It's an inconvenience when one come to my house unannounced. Jesus is showing up with an entourage if he had 40 or 50 people with him. Come on, think for a moment. The servant expects inconvenience, but watch this now. But Zacchaeus brings him to the crib. The Bible says that they hang out all day. Jesus talks to him, shares some things, and there's something that happens because Zacchaeus answered the call and made a decision to become a servant of God. Let me serve you in this moment. Because he made a decision to become a servant of God, the Bible says something else happened. It says that Zacchaeus and his entire household got saved and baptized in the name of Jesus. See, special things happen for the servant. In the, watch this now. In the process or in the act of serving. While being, these things happened while being a servant. Hallelujah. Zacchaeus is there, Jesus is there, his disciples are there, his entourage is there. They are being served and blessings and amazing things are happening on the inside of Zacchaeus and happening inside of his household, in his life, in his future, and upon his family. The same thing is going to happen to you. Every servant will, will have to uh, will conf will, must confront and overcome at least four obstacles. It's not an exhaustive list, but I just want to share. They must confront and overcome at least four obstacles uh, to, uh, to committing uh, to serving God. Number one is the flesh. Everyone say the flesh. The flesh is really pride. It is the selfish, instinctive desire to not trust, but to choose to save and provide for oneself. This is where you start saying, you know what, I can't trust and wait on God. I got to do this for myself. Amen. Although, now, now, now we see this happen. Now, now this, there is always going to be the temptation to do this. A true servant of God must overcome it. You've got to overcome the temptation to do that, to get out of the way and start, get out of God's path and start trying to do things for yourself. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus was tempted to do the same thing. 
In the Garden of Gethsemane, remember Jesus is like, yo, you know what, dear Father, if there's any way, if there's another way, God, take this cup from me. And it says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done, right? Well, let's think about this for a moment. A temptation is not a temptation unless it's a temptation. Let me say that again. A temptation is not a temptation unless it is a temptation. Hallelujah. Which means that this was something that Jesus' flesh would really desire to do. If there's any other way that I can avoid, I mean, imagine, imagine if Jesus said, hey, I mean, if the Lord came to you and said, hey, listen, I'm, I'm going to use you for something great. You say, okay, God, I'm ready. And he say, okay, say, listen, I need you to put yourself in a place where you're going to be tortured, beat to death, ridiculed, spit on. Come on now. And then nailed to the cross uh, and left there for hours in the hot baking sun until you die. <laughs> I, I believe we would have found a garden. And we would, have, we, would have, we would have sought a different way. Father, mighty God. Well, I mean, we would have got real deep. Y'all know what it is. You know, when, when people, when they, when, they start, when they get real deep and, and he's no longer God, but he's God. <laughs> Father God, in the name of Jesus. God, I know you had this plan for me to go forward and to lay down my life, but I believe that you have a better way. And just like Martin Luther King, I had a dream there was another way. <laughs> Father, use your infinite wisdom. Deep, dig deep down into your Holy Spirit. And out of that, come up with the, out of the reservoir of your wisdom, a creative way that I don't have to go to the cross. <laughs> we would have prayed that same prayer. It was a temptation. It was a temptation. Adam and Eve had the same temptation. Now watch now. Because Satan said now, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will come into the knowledge of good and evil and you will become like God. Now think now. So, no, 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 no. Don't wait on the process. God meets with you and walks with you during the cool of every day, but don't wait for that. You've got to get off of God's plan, get on your own plan, and you've got to do what you need to do to take care of you. That's the real, that was the temptation that they failed to overcome. The Bible says that Eve goes to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She looks at the fruit and she sees that it is one to be desired to make one wise. I don't have to wait on God. I could just take of this fruit, a shortcut. And I can do it for myself. That was the temptation. Have you failed? Have you fallen to the temptation to lead yourself, to do things your way and getting off the plan of God? God is taking too long. And so I cannot continue to walk here with God because it's, 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 it's taking too long. So let me step out. Your pastor experienced the same thing. Remember the story of when I signed with the Falcons? I signed with the Atlanta Falcons. The New England Patriots called Lady Ruth and tell her, where's, your, where's Carl? She says he's in Atlanta, signed, about to sign with the Falcons. She said, tell him don't sign. Hallelujah. Tell he heard what we have to offer. Lady Ruth, when I talked to her, she says, New England called. They said, don't sign. I said, okay, cool. Well, you know what, God, I appreciate I had prayed about everything up until this point. Now I'm getting ready to get off of God's plan and get on my own. God, I don't want to go to New England. It's cold. <laughs> Got off of his plan, did my own thinking, reasoning, and decision-making without seeking out the counsel of the Holy Spirit. That caused me to have a short stay. See, when we, dis when we get off of God's plan, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you still won't experience some victory. It's just that you won't be as victorious as he wanted you to be. Did I still play professional football? I did. Did I sign with the Falcons? I did. Google me, bro. I'm in there. Okay, I'm kidding. But my stay was a short one. 
it was shorter than what God intended. That's the issue. That's what happens when we set out to do things on our own. God had intended that Adam and Eve would be in a special place in the garden, or have a special relationship. But because they set out to make their own self wise, they end up leaving the place that God had prepared for them to spend and be. Amen. The children of Israel, when, they, when God brought them out of bondage, out of slavery, out of being broke and beaten and tattered, he brought them out of Egypt and said, I'm taking you to the promised land where you will have your own, where you'll be successful and victorious. And the journey from, from Egypt into the promised land was supposed to take a couple days. And it took 40 years. Because they decided that we don't need to go into the promised land. They decided, no, 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 we, can, we can't. Caleb said, we can go into the promised land and possess it. And they said, no, we can't. We need to take care of ourselves. God's not going to do it. We will always be tempted through pride and everything else to care and provide for ourselves. Major, main, primary temptation of the devil working through the flesh. No, 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 tithe. Why would you tithe? You're already, listen. Listen, God understands. And God said, trust me. God says, honor me first. Come to me first. Stick with my path and let me lead you. I'm, it starts with trust and relationship. I don't trust God. That's why I don't tithe. We never articulate that out loud. But I've learned that actions, my God from heaven, speak louder than words. I've got to overcome the obstacle of the flesh, the temptation to do things on my own, to do what I think I need to do to take care of me and just call on God afterwards when I need a little help. You know, when the doctor's report came in, I said, okay, God, yeah, now I need you. I handled the rest. Amen. Second obstacle we need to overcome is the world. The world. The world is philosophical and cultural differences between kingdom and worldly culture. There is a major difference in the way the world thinks and the way we think. The world says you got to take care of yourself. God says, no, you don't. You got to take care of the things of me and I will take care of you. Number three, circumstances. Circumstances. Servants expect inconveniences, these, these three mountains, these three obstacles here. Circumstances. Circumstances are situational obstacles that stand in the way of you serving God and others. Circumstances. What's, what are they? What do they look like? Time. Well, I don't have enough time. Everyone say a circumstance. And an obstacle. you got to overcome it. Scheduling. Listen, my schedule is so busy. You need to clear your schedule so that you have time to serve. We already know that serving God will produce inconveniences. It's not always going to be convenient for me to help somebody. Amen. I just have to do it because I know it needs to be done. Number three, distance. Sometimes it's, you know, oh, I got to go all the way to church. You guys overcame some of the obstacles that people cannot seem to overcome. When it's raining outside, they choose not to get up and go to church. They go to work, though. They, they go to the party, though. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. You have to overcome. Sometimes you have to overcome people. Because the enemy will use people to discourage you. You have to overcome that obstacle. Sir, I would serve on the ushers, but I don't like the head usher. She get on my nerves. Hallelujah. If, if the devil knows that all he has to do is agitate you, he's, he's going to do it. So, oh, all I got to do is agitate them a little bit and that'll keep them from serving God? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, I got plenty of emissaries. I got people who are on my team right now. And some of you right now say, oh, yes, pastor, I know exactly where the devil is in the earth. He's at my job in my supervisor's office. He's in there. Hallelujah. Don't you, you cannot, you cannot allow, you cannot allow people to push you off of serving God. Amen. 
I'm not going to allow the devil to, dis- to keep me from serving. Amen. Hallelujah. Lastly, sometimes, you know, it's just because of resources. And people, you know, it's just resources. They, you know, I don't, you know they, they, they choose not to because they don't have enough. Amen. God says, follow, choose to serve me. Choose to serve me. Remember in, remember in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in the book of Kings, remember, remember the woman says, the woman says, Elijah says to her, hey, go make me a, a little cake, a morsel of bread. She said, I don't, I, don't, I don't have enough. I do not have enough. He says, no, 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 you have enough. You have enough. She says, no, I don't have enough. I got a little bit of meal and a little bit of oil. I'm going to make a last meal, and me and my son are going to die. This is all we have to eat. He says, no, you have enough. So and release your faith. Listen, listen to what he tells her to do. Make a small morsel of bread. Make a small cake for me first. Honor God. Obey God. Release your faith. Then make for you and your son. He says, as the Lord lives, you're not going to run out of resources. She has to choose to serve and trust and believe God. She's got to overcome these situational circumstances. Lastly, number three, you've got to overcome the enemy. You've got to overcome the enemy. He's, listen, he's coming to tempt you. Got it? He is coming. What does that mean, Pastor? You've got to overcome demonic distractions designed to discourage, frustrate, and collapse your faith. That's what they're designed to do, to discourage, frustrate, and collapse your faith. Amen. And so, you know, the enemy is going to work through people. He's going to attack your mental health. Have you ever just, you know, you, all of a sudden you start feeling sad and getting depressed for no reason? Nothing's wrong. That may have been a, a, a spiritual attack. You might say, oh, I have no reason to be sad. I have no reason to be depressed. Hallelujah. And I won't allow a spirit of depression to come on me. Satan, the Lord, rebuke you. And I rebuke you. Leave now in Jesus' name. Amen. It could be the negative comments of others, that this, uh, Satan using people that, that you trust, people that you love, or people who influence you that uh, speak negative words and those kind of things over you and begin to, you know, talk to you. That's why you got to be careful who's in your circle and who's, you know, y'all know what I'm talking about? Amen. It could be stress or issues on the job. He'll use all of these things, all of these things to hinder you, to be a mountain to you serving. It could be relationships. Any of those things, you've got to work through it. Amen. And overcome it. Confront it and overcome it. Oh, pastor told me about this. Yeah, I'm ready. Hallelujah. Number three. Number three. All right. Five revelations of a servant of God. Number three, or or number one, uh, servants think differently. Number two, servants expect and experience uh, inconveniences. Number three, servants are made through submission and obedience to God. Servants are actually made, they are made, they are made through uh, submission and obedience to God. Sub meaning under, sub carries with it the connotation or understanding of an individual giving up their right. That means that I make myself subservient, I make myself of no reputation, and I give myself over to God to whatever he wants to do. It has to do with a person thinking and making themselves like a slave. Father, I'm here for you. Whatever you want to do, I'm ready to do it. Whatever you want me to say, I'm ready to say it. Wherever you want me to go, I'm ready to go. Whatever it is that you need me to do when I get there, I'm ready to do it. And the word mission, mission means work. It means operation. And this is where it, it, it also, it, it carries, the, it's, it's from the Latin root word uh, that, uh, that actually means sent. And so this is where I begin to submit myself to God and I'm sent on his behalf to fulfill and to carry out his mission. A true servant of God relieves themselves of their own personal agenda because that's what Satan is going to use to distract you and they take up the agenda of God. Father, my life belongs to you. Hallelujah. I give myself over to you. Now lead and guide me as you want me to do. That's why you can't say whatever you want to say. You don't get to go wherever you want to go. You don't get to do because you've made yourself of no reputation. You've made yourself a slave of God. And now you've decided to give yourself over to the service of God. And by doing that, God says, I'm going to make you something. Watch this now. Matthew, the 14th chapter and the 19th verse in the King James Bible says, And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. 
It is through the following that God is able to do the making. Everybody keeps wanting everything instant, instant, instant. Listen to me, fine wine takes time, baby. Yeah. Hallelujah. If you want the best, it takes, it takes time. We, you, you've got to walk with God for some time that you begin to overcome every obstacle and temptation that the enemy faces. You are filled with wisdom. You know what to do. You know how to tell other people what to do. You can lead other people out. You can declare other people's freedom. You can take authority over the enemy and change an atmosphere. Why? Because you walk with God. Look at this in the Passion Translation. It says, Jesus called out to them. I know you thought you chose God with your old sophisticated, intelligent, successful, prosperous self says, no, you didn't call out to me. God says, I called out to you. Jesus called out to them and said, come and what? Follow me. Don't try to lead God. He says, follow. And in the following, I will. He says, you're going to be changed now. As you follow. This is real good because this lets you know that along the way, you might still make some mistakes. You might still make some bad decisions or choices. You might still have a bad attitude. He's working on that. But as you follow, you're going to be what? Transformed. He says, I'm going to make you somebody different. This is really important because the word make in the Greek uh, uh, carries the meaning of build or create. It carries the connotation of making something from nothing. It's always in reference to God because he is the only one that is able to make something from nothing. Do y'all know when he made man, the Bible says he formed him out of the what? The dust of the ground. This is interesting because dust ain't worth nothing. He didn't say soil because soil is valuable. You find good soil, you put the right seed in it and what is it going to do? I think it's going to grow. But he made man out of the what? Dust. And what do you do with dust? <laughs> It's dust, ooh. He took the least of nothing that is worth nothing and he put it in his hands and made something of it. However you feel, I'm telling you, whatever you feel like you failed in at life, if you give yourself over to God, God said, I know you felt like you was nothing. I know they treated you like you was nothing. I know they look at you like you're nothing, but I'm gonna make something special out of you. The servant of God always experiences ascension. God moves you from a place of being worth nothing to something being worth in, of, of great value. See, when God got finished with shaping and making Adam and Eve out of the dust of the ground, Satan came looking to tempt them and to come after them. Why? Because they were now something of When you feel stuff going crazy around you, don't, don't look around and say, oh, man, why me? You say, oh, baby, he's got his eyes set on me because I'm a valuable target, baby. That's right. But, you, but I'm going to let you know, Satan, you picked the wrong one today. Hallelujah. We about to kick some devil butt up in here, praise the Lord. You've been chosen. Come on, musicians. Let me close with this last point. I'm going to give you one more, and we'll, 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 we'll have to get... We'll have to get the fifth one on Wednesday or, or I might come back. You know, I won't give it to you Sunday because, yeah. Well, maybe I will. I don't know. I mean, Wednesday. Yeah, I might. Yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll finish it up on Wednesday. Uh, yeah, well, I, you know, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you number four. It's just number five. We, you know, you won't have time because <clears throat> y'all not, not going to fuss at me today and say, Pastor kept us for so How many first-time special guests? This your first time here? Look at that. See that? All them people be like, your pastor preached too long. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, I'll take you to number four. Number four, God obligates himself to his servant. He obligates. Now, listen to me carefully. He obligates himself to his servants. Bible says in Job 36 and 11 in the voice translation, he says, if you hear and choose to serve. 
You gotta, you gotta choose. See, see, no matter what happens, you've gotta make a choice. And so the word has gone forth today. And he says, if you hear the word your pastor's preaching and you choose to serve, because I'm always gonna leave you in a place where you get to make the choice. The choice is always yours. Amen. Hallelujah. If you hear and choose to serve him, then they will end their days in prosperity and their years in felicity. Felicity means intense joy and happiness. He says, if you make this decision to serve, something's going to happen in your life. Amen. Amazing things are going to happen in your life, but you've got to choose it. Look at Jeremiah 33 and 3. Jeremiah 33 and 3. Hallelujah. He says, call to me and I will answer you and I'll show you great and mighty things. Fenced in and hidden, which you do not know, do not distinguish or recognize. Have knowledge of and, or of and understand. He says, as a servant of God, if you call on me, I'll show you some stuff. I'll show you some stuff you didn't even know about. He says, fenced in and hidden, things that you didn't know about or understand. He said, even if you did see them, you would have never understood them. But I'll show them to you and I'll bring forth understanding in you. Think about this for a moment. You remember when uh, uh, Elijah was, Elisha is in, is in the mountain. The Bible says that he is there with, with his servant. And uh, what happens is, is that the king, the king has been trying to attack Israel, and every time they get ready to attack, Elijah would pray, talk to God, God would give him instruction, and then tell, tell the king, uh, 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 he would go tell the king what the, what the people are going to do. And then the, the king said, hey, listen, which one of y'all are spies for the Israelites? They said, no, none of us. For, for uh, the, the, the prophet Elijah tells the king of Israel what you do in your bedchamber. God is revealing things to him. He said, all right, then we need to find him and kill him. They found Elijah in the mountain in a cave. Bible says that he sent soldiers that night, and early in the morning, they had all surrounded the entire mountain. There was no way Elijah was getting ready to get away. His servant wakes up early in the morning, goes out for a morning stroll, and he sees all these soldiers surrounding the mountain. He runs back in, and he says, Oh, man, alas, master, alas, alas, they have found us. Man, we're going to die today. Elijah says, ooh, ooh, ooh. Ah, bring my coffee. <laughs> Takes a sip of his coffee, and he walks out of the cave, and he says, no, 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 son. For they that are with us are more than they that are with them. Imagine his servant looked at Elijah. He says, One, two, and then look down. No, 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 master. Two. He said, no, 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 there are more with us than there are with them. The Bible says at that moment, Elijah began to pray. And he prayed and said, Lord, remove the scales. He's your servant. Allow him to see. Open his eyes that he might see the fenced in and hidden things that he would have never understood. The Bible says that God immediately, on the prayer of his chief servant, opened the eyes of the young servant. And he saw there nestled in the mountains horses and chariots of fire completely surrounding Elisha and the mountain and all of the soldiers that wanted to attack. His soldiers are on the ground. Elisha's soldiers are in the clouds. I imagine his servant's mouth hit the floor. And he says, I didn't even know. That's where most Christians are, in the place where we don't know because we have not chosen to believe and accept God and serve him. Because he says that when you call on me as a servant, I'm going to show you stuff that you didn't know was available. Amen. When you serve, 
you've got to make up a decision, make a decision in your mind that you're not going to let go and you're not going to quit. Sometimes we don't make it because we give up too early. With these promises and the entitlement blessings, uh, faith that, that comes on the believer who chooses to wholeheartedly uh, believe, there's this word of entitlement. Everyone say entitlement. In our society, in our culture, we kind of treat it like it's a bad word, but it's not really a bad word. The word simply means, it's defined, and let me pull up the definition for me. It, it means you have a legal right to do to, to something, believing oneself to be inherently deserving of privileges or special treatment. This is where you finally begin to believe that you're supposed to be victorious because you're a servant of God. That you're supposed to be healed because you're a servant of God. That you're supposed to recover because you're a servant of God. That you're supposed to be on top because you're a servant of God. That you're supposed to be the head and not the tail because you're a servant of God. This is where you really believe to take God at his word and say, no, good things are supposed to happen to me because I've chosen to serve God with my whole heart, with my whole life and everything that I have. I'm entitled to be blessed. I'm entitled to a better life. I'm entitled to peace. I'm entitled to joy. I'm entitled to health. I'm entitled to wholeness. I'm entitled to have all my needs met. Here is this account in the Bible where Joshua makes a public decision and confession. His decision was already made long ago, but he confesses it before people in Joshua, 20, uh, Joshua 24. He says, if it seems evil to you to serve God, then choose whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He says, no, we're going to serve God. We're not going to be just a, a, a people of a religious tradition. No, we're going to serve God. He's talking about wholeheartedly serve God. Because he had this revelation and understanding, and this is where I'm going to, I'm going to close out today. With this level of revelation and understanding, you've got to accept that into your heart and into your mind that because you gave your life to Christ, because you chose to serve God, that you are entitled to favor and blessing. Listen to me. You have a legal right to the blessing and favor of God. Joshua knows this, so this is what happens to Joshua. In the book of Joshua, the, the seventh chapter, uh, they're getting ready to go into a battle, but they're fighting a little small group of, of, uh, of, of bandits or what have you. And so Joshua and them are just a small village, that, and Joshua sends out 3,000 soldiers. That's all we need. We're good. The Bible records that, that uh, they are defeated. 30, 30 Israelite soldiers get killed and the rest of them, the rest of the 2,970 are running for their lives. Now look at Joshua. Let's read this together. Verse 4. Let's read. Ready? Read. So approximately 3,000 warriors were sent, but they were soundly, he says, they got smashed. They got crushed. It wasn't even close. I ain't talking about where you lose 51 to 52. No, they got destroyed. Amen. That's not the most, that, that, is, that is surprising, but the part that I want you to focus on is how Joshua reacts. Let's read verse 6. Ready? Read. Joshua and his elders of Israel tore their clothes in... They tore their clothes in what? They are blown away. Why did we lose? We are not supposed to lose, ever. They are so distraught, so confused, so surprised by this that they tore their clothes. The Bible says they fall down before the Ark of the Covenant and they cover themselves with ashes and sackcloth. And they said, God, this was not supposed to happen. Why has this happened? What in the world is going on? This is what I want you to get. Joshua said, we're never supposed to lose. 
Because he had the revelation on entitlement. He says, because of who I am, because I've chosen to serve God, I know that we're supposed to win at whatever we set our heart and minds to do. With this revelation and this, this understanding of entitled blessing, why is it that Christians then accept loss on a regular and consistent basis? Think about it. We've allowed the culture of the world to enter into our relationships, and we say things like the world say. We say, well, you win some and you... That's not what Joshua and the elders said. They said, no, 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 no. We're supposed to win. We're supposed to win. God promised me that we're supposed to win. They laid out before God and they sought him regarding what happens. See, the issue is, is that we give up and we accept defeat. We accept that this is supposed to be part of our experience. You win some and you lose some. When God says, no, I want you to be victorious. All you've got to do is stay in the game. Stay in the game. There was a lady... I won't share her name. I'll share it with you at some other time. When, uh, when I'll share her testimony and everything with you at another day. But there was a lady who was uh, praying for deliverance of her daughter. She was fighting uh, for her, for her uh, deliverance and freedom of her daughter. And uh, she had fought for two years. And people were asking, even loved ones was asking her, well, why are you still praying? It's been two years. She said, you just watch. You keep watching. God's going to deliver. He's going to deliver. God's going to show up. God is going to answer. You just keep watching. She had made up her mind. I'm a servant of God. God, I serve you. God, I'm going to hang with you. God, I'm still believing. She waited two years, 24 months. Some of us can't wait 24 minutes before we give up. We can't wait 24 hours. We can't wait 24 days. Just think she waited 24 months. But she stayed in faith. And even while people were saying to her, why don't you just quit? Why are you still praying? Because I believe. After 24 months had passed, she, she released a special prayer to God still in faith. God told her to go in there and lay hands on your baby. She went in and asked her baby, can I pray for you? She says, yes. She began to pray for her, hallelujah, releasing her faith. And her baby was delivered and healed and restored, hallelujah. Why did this happen? Because she knew she was entitled. I have a right for my daughter to be healed. I have a right for my daughter to be whole. And I will not let go of the promise. I will fight until I receive it. The Bible says in Galatians, the sixth chapter and the ninth verse, he says, so let not, let's not get tired in doing what is good. Let's continue to serve God. Let's continue to honor God. Let's continue to practice the principles of God, releasing our faith over situations, declaring our healing and our deliverance and our recovery over situations, saying over our lives what God has said over our lives. And just at just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. She said, I won't give up. Yeah, it's been six months. I won't give up. Yeah, it's been nine months. I won't give up. It's already been a year, but I won't give up. It's already been 14 months, but I won't give up. It's been a year and a half now, but I won't give up. It's been a year and nine months, but I won't give up. Oh, it's been 24 months, but I won't give up because I know that I have a right. Why? Because I chose to serve God. I chose to serve Him. I won't quit. In what area have you been experiencing defeat? Because you have not completely surrendered to and trusted God. What area are you struggling because you haven't completely surrendered and trusted God? Make a decision now to serve him and to trust him. Abraham waited 25 years for the manifestation of the promised child. 
Can you wait 25 years? Will you keep trusting God even when you don't see it manifest yet? Somebody shout, I believe. I believe. You must still believe during the season of contradiction. No matter what that season looked like, believe him. He says, I'm going to show you. In the waiting, I'm developing in you God-like character. In the waiting, I'm developing in you God-like faith. In the waiting, I'm developing in you God-like trust. In the waiting, I'm developing in you God-like wisdom. In the waiting, I'm developing in you God-like power. In the waiting, I'm developing in you God-like character. Ha <laughs> yeah. In the waiting, I'm developing in you a God-like example. Hallelujah. In the waiting, I'm developing in you a mighty man, a mighty woman of God that the devil will not be able to withstand because I am making you a true warrior and representative of me in the earth. I'm developing you. Hallelujah. God says don't quit. Don't give up. This is your time. I'm excited about where he's going.